this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and numberfire.com, where today we are getting you set for week 15 in the NFL NFL from a betting perspective, as Ed and I are going through what we think about these games and breaking down our leans on week 15's biggest games. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here, as always, by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. Ed, it is week 15, the playoffs on the horizon. Things starting to crystallize from a playoff perspective. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. Looking forward to another good week of uh, NFL action. Uh, you know, we haven't missed the game yet, so let's keep it rolling. And, uh, yeah, should be a great week. A lot of good Somehow. games to talk about. Yeah, somehow no games missed thus far. Uh, it's been an interesting year so far. We've seen teams moving and shaking. The Baltimore Ravens initially seemed like they were going to be this powerhouse team. They had a fun game Monday. Then yeah. it was the Steelers who were all the rage. And right. Ed, ever since you had that video on Twitter about the Steelers, they're <laughs> going too, man. Yeah, so, I mean, they, they weren't really supposed to lose to Washington, and they did, so that was kind of good. And then, uh, you know, I mean, the markets moved to Buffalo as a two-point favorite in that game. Very tight in the first half. And then, you know, Buffalo did, you know, Buffalo isn't the perfect NFL team, but right now they do. If you want to do one thing well in the NFL, it's throw the ball. Yeah. And that's one thing that Buffalo can do. And they did just enough of it uh, to get by the Steelers. Steelers didn't get any defensive touchdowns, didn't get enough turnovers. So, uh, yeah. I mean, that, I, that I, Buffalo I feel team fortunate is kind of the way things have happened after that video. Right. Uh, it, it, but it also comes in the heels of your Carson Wentz prediction of him throwing more picks. So it's it's a good year to be Ed. I think that's the, the big <laughs> takeaway here. A lot of good predictions out of you. And we'll see if we can get some more good predictions about week 15 here in just a bit. But first, we're looking for some college football thoughts for this week and thoughts on the conference championship games. We had Adam Kramer on the podcast yesterday. Adam was fantastic, had a lot of good thoughts on those conference championships. You can find that by searching for Covering the Spread. Wherever you get your podcast, make sure you are subscribed. And while you're there, leave us a rating and review as well. Next week, we'll have one show previewing the Week 16 NFL slate. That'll be up on Tuesday evening, uh, getting you set for those. So hopefully we can get ahead of some early line movement for once, which would be pretty cool. So looking forward to that. Make sure you're subscribed to get that podcast. Podcast as we go live, we'll go back to college stuff as we get set for the college football playoff the following week. Now, before we take a look at week 15, we do got to go back to week 14. We had Olivia Moody on the show to break down week 14, and Olivia had some good insights on the Washington football team before they had themselves a really good week. Covering the past. So last week when we had Olivia Moody on the show, she was saying that she liked the Washington football team both from a futures perspective and within their game with the 49ers. She had Washington plus three and a half against the 49ers. They did close the three, so half a point of movement there. And even with Alex Smith getting hurt during the game, Washington was able to cover and get the win there. And we talked with Olivia last week, and at the time, they were plus money to win the NFC East. They're now right. minus 260 because the Giants lost their game. The Washington won, and now the Giants may not have Colt McCoy. But the problem, Ed, is that Washington may not have Alex Smith. But either way, right. good recommendations for Olivia there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, my numbers sided on that a little bit. I think I think they had San Francisco by two uh, in a game in which the spread was three. So, um, but yeah, I think when you when you look at those two two teams, and we're going to get into the Giants a little bit later in the show. Uh, yeah, you you want to side with Washington. They're they're put together in a better way, and we'll get into that later. And I think that. It is a downgrade for sure from Alex Smith to ha Dwayne Haskins, but it potentially could be for just this week. And honestly, like the, the efficiency metrics between them aren't all that different. I think the advantage of Alex Smith is that he's probably less prone to blow ups. And if you have that good defense, you want less volatility. You want the more stable force because you sure. can get by on that. Uh, whereas Haskins may be a bit more volatile, but it's not a huge drop off either way. Big game with Seattle coming up this week, too. Yeah, absolutely. I think the markets would disagree with you a little bit there. They they yeah. like Alex Smith uh, more than Dwayne Haskins, and I think for good reason. Yeah, uh, I'm just basing it off of the efficiency numbers, but like, you know, if you watch it, you can kind of understand why that's the case. You can understand why uh, markets would favor 
Alex Smith over Dwayne Haskins. But either way, good recommendation by Olivia there. And we'll see if Washington can close the deal and get that future done for her as well. We both had thoughts on that Bucks vikings game. Olivia was on the Bucks money line at minus 310. I wanted the Vikings plus six and a half. And the money line, never in question. Easy win there for Olivia. Good recommendation by her. I could have gotten that cover, Ed, but Dan yep. Bailey missed three field goals and yep. an extra point. That's yep. 10 points off the board. The Vikings lost by 12. So that was super fun. I was not hateful the entire day as a result of Dan Bailey by any means. Uh, <laughs> Bailey also helped Olivia get the under at 52 and a half. So Dan Bailey, really good to Olivia. Not as nice to me. So Olivia correctly diagnosed that game. I am left wondering why the Vikings hate me. I think that's actually the, the <laughs> correct. T- it's not that they hate good kickers, it's that they hate me specifically here. They hate you personally. Yeah. Not, awesome. not like he's losing any money in his next contract or whatnot on that performance, but right. Exactly. So, uh, Dan Bailey and I, Dan Bailey will no longer get a Christmas card. That's what I'll say there. <laughs> Olivia and I were also on the same side for the Steelers bills. game we talked about before that didn't go well for either of us. She had the Steelers plus one and a half. I had the Steelers money line at plus one twenty four along with the over at 46 and a half. And the weather wound up being bad in that game, which made the total look a bit tougher. But even with the weather, the total still closed at 49. So uh, got two and a half points of movement there. The Steelers' money line closed at plus 110 at FanDuel Sportsbook. So the markets did move towards us, but the result very much did not. The Steelers' offense was bad again. The Bills won by 11. The under hit two. I was like holding out hope that the Steelers would mount this big comeback push that game towards the over, get me that money line win. Just a rough week uh, across the board here. And I think that we had talked about this game a bit at last week where you right. were like, okay, like I was against Steelers before, but I, I think I can understand the thought process and trying to buy low, but like, yeah. they just look bad, man. They look bad. Yeah. I mean, I think they're just going through, you know, I mean, they're going through the struggles that that any NFL team goes through, right? And the struggles that you kind of don't see when you're 11 and 0 and and 5 and 0 in one score games and and getting defensive touchdowns like they were. So it's not like the Steelers are a bad football team by any stretch, right? right? right. I mean, that defense is legit, um, and you're going to see them win some games and and be a threat in the playoffs. Uh, it's they're just going through some rough times. And they have been not kind uh, to me over this past week. So Steelers, uh, again, no Christmas cards for them. You and Olivia were both on the Ravens, minus two and a half against the Browns. Two and a half being the key there, because that that closed at Baltimore minus three, which is obviously a key number. And the safety didn't wind up mattering for you, too. You had the cover regardless. You were all set. So kudos on that. You were going to cover regardless. But the Ravens covered minus three, too, thanks to the safety in the final play. FanDuel Sportsbook, though, did give a a bad beat refund to people who had bet the Browns plus three or or plus four and a half and stuff like that. So, like, even if you had that, it wound up being fine. But, you know, you were kind of safe regardless, unless they'd pulled the Rutgers and scored in that final play, basically. Yeah, I I mean, I bet this at, at Baltimore minus one. And so I I'd, I'd kind of talked to you about like having just the best week ever in closing line movement and yeah. like 500 week. But this was a game in which it actually worked out right. Um, some of the underlying metrics actually favored Cleveland when I looked at it afterwards. Like, I mean, it was a close game, kind of could have taken a couple plays. Uh, but what I, I think Baltimore is a really interesting team, right? Because they come at you in a like they're the complete curveball in what they yeah. want to do. They, they're going to try to run it in the ground. They're going to use the athleticism of Lamar Jackson. And you don't prepare for that any week, right? And I still think, I mean, as much as they struggled, I can see them being a pretty tough out. I mean, especially with how good their defense is. Um, and, you know, I mean, we've seen what that offense can do. Like it hasn't, it hasn't come, uh, you know, they haven't been as good as they were last year by any stretch, right? But you can kind of see it, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's not like Cleveland is is a great defense by any stretch. But I think I think Baltimore is a really interesting curveball team for anyone facing them in the playoffs. And they've just fully leaned into their identity of being a run-heavy team. Because in the past two games, they've scored 34 and I think it was 47 points on Monday night. And they've thrown right. the ball 34 total times right. between those two games combined. I guess... Trace McSorley had a couple too, but Lamar has thrown the ball right. 34 total times. And Trace but McSorley I, pass, pass attempts probably don't count as a full pass attempt either. For sure. And, and But I think you could kind of see in that game, right? There was one play where Miles Garrett just completely whiffed on a, an option read because yeah. I don't think he 
ever thinks about that, right? Like he doesn't think you don't think about that for 31 teams in the league. Right. And if they're going to be able to get chunk plays on the ground, I mean, this kind of goes uh, <laughs> this kind of goes against everything I've ever said about sure. analytics and the passing game and stuff. But but it's just kind of interesting to think about because in some sense they did that last year too, where they right. were just so efficient running the ball, they threw when they needed to, and and they were efficient there as well. And you saw the results. Um, yeah, it's just I, I just think it's a really interesting team. I, I think the preparation discussion is very interesting because you can kind of comp it back to the team that actually eliminated Baltimore last year with Tennessee because hmm. they're also a very unique team because, you know, we're not used to tackling Lamar Jackson. You're also not used to tackling like a, a rhinoceros in Derrick Henry. Like right. you can't prepare for that in any way. Right. So those unique teams, those teams that have these unique skill sets, that can be a leg up. And the reason that we favor passing over rushing is because almost every single time passing will be more efficient than rushing. Right. You know, for some teams like the Eagles this year, uh, that's not the case. <laughs> like they've been more efficient running than they have been passing. So I yeah. think that it's kind of like boiling it down to specific situations with the, with the Ravens. It's a different situation because they have such a dynamic athlete, a quarterback that definitely changes things. And like you said, a unique situation That'll be tough to game plan for in the playoffs. So maybe they can play spoiler uh, in the role that they were defeated in last year. So they'll be a fun team for sure. And I saw some smart people on Ravens futures before that. It was actually before Lamar tested positive for COVID. Um, so things obviously change, but they're still 14 to one to win the Super Bowl. I probably wouldn't be willing to quite get there, but like you're comparing them to Tampa Bay, comparing them I honestly think that it's not outrageous to favor the Ravens over the Steelers if you're betting the Super Bowl. Like, I think that from an upside perspective, I feel like the Ravens' upside might be yeah. better. Uh, yeah. But it's a it's an interesting market for sure, and they're an interesting team. Uh, well, and, and again, like Pittsburgh really struggles at the one thing that you want to do as an NFL team, right? Right. Throw right. the football. I mean, it's like not, they throw it a lot. They just don't throw it that well. What? They throw it a lot. They just don't throw it that effectively. They're, they're just not particularly efficient this year for, for a number of reasons, right? Right. And, yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Very interesting team for sure. So I'm, I'm looking forward to watching the Ravens when playoff time rolls around. But uh, good week for Olivia Moody. Make sure you follow her on Twitter, at Live Moods. Check her out on the Book Hit app as well. And she also did uh, an episode of the FanDuel Hurry Up this week as well. So a lot of stuff from Olivia on the pipeline. We're going to get to week 15 here in just one second. But first, for all of you Colorado listeners out there, FanDuel Bud Light and the Denver Broncos have partnered together to create the Bud Light Pick and Kick bonus with one goal in mind to give you more ways to win this NFL season. The program is simple. For every field goal and every extra point the Broncos kicker makes against the Buffalo Bills on December 19th, fans who placed a money line bet of at least $25 in the game will receive a $3 bonus added to their FanDuel Sportsbook account. If the Broncos kick three field goals and three extra points, that's $18 in bonus cash all right to you. December 19th is just a couple of days away. So crack open a Bud Light, download the FanDuel Sportsbook mobile app, and place your bet today. Now let's get set for week number 15. Ed and I talking about this week's biggest games and letting you know where we see some value this week. Covering the present. All right, and before we dive into the biggest games across Week 15, I did want to dabble in the futures market with you because we talked to a lot of our guests about the NSC futures market, and I want to get your perspective on this because you have the numbers to back it up. You can check what they say about this, and it's a really interesting market because there's no definitive favorite. Things did flip towards Green Bay last week because they got that win, whereas the Saints lost to Philadelphia. Green Bay now plus 270. The Saints are plus 280 at FanDuel Sportsbook. The Rams plus 450. Any interest for you in the top of the board or any longer team standing out to you as of right now? Yeah. So first I should mention, like, I don't actually have numbers on these probabilities. Like I don't take my, um, my metrics and, and play out the season and, and give you a probability that some team is going to play. So what I'm actually going to do here is kind of talk about both what my numbers say, but also like thinking about which numbers could be off in some mm -hmm. sense. And I think the team that actually interests me the most is Tampa Bay. Um, I think this team could actually have the most upside of any team in in the conference. Uh, we know what the defense could do. Um, the offense hasn't been particularly good. Uh, they're 16th when I look at adjusted success rate. But, you know, when you look at Tom Brady, uh, he's been pretty good. He's got the fifth highest passer rating when uh, w by PFF. So so they, they think he's been pretty good. 
Um, from what I've seen, I think he's looked pretty good. The long pass touchdown he had against Minnesota was just about as perfect as anyone can throw a ball. And, you know, I mean, they haven't really put it together on the offensive side of the ball. And I feel like they've, they've been kind of up and down. But he went there because he has weapons like oh, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. Uh, Evans is great. It's haven't been great this year. I, I don't know if he's been banged up. Has he been banged up? Yeah, he's been banged up all year. Uh, he's healthy now, though, which is good. Right. So they can't run the ball, but but who cares, right? right. So when when you put when you think about that, um, Tampa Bay doesn't necessarily look as good in the metric as I think they could. Uh, we know what Brady can do. The the PFF grade suggests that he can continue to do it at, at that level. And you just contrast that with like the Los Angeles Rams, who are actually you know one of the best teams when you look at the metrics this year. But like, what is the ceiling for Jared Goff, right? right. We're we're probably seeing it, or at least I mean, we certainly saw it in what he did um, uh, against the against the Bucks defense. But yeah, so that's the kind of thinking. I, I I'm interested in Tampa Bay plus six hundred there. Um, I just think they they probably have some offense that they they haven't shown so far this season that could really come out towards the playoffs. Does that mean that they're going to do it? No, no, they could continue to be this crazy up and down team that they've essentially been and right. losing their first playoff game as well. But there, I think there is some potentially about it. I mean, they're six to one. So like volatility is not a bad thing for you in that right. sense. Like if, if they fall flat, who cares? You know, it's six to one. Um, I, I think that like the Packers are actually kind of interesting despite being plus two seventy. they should get that first round by, uh, Based on their remaining schedule, based on the fact right. they have they had the tiebreaker over the Saints too, uh, because they won a head to head matchup, and I think they're a game up now. And Aaron Rodgers is playing really good football, and I think right. that's noteworthy. I've tried to tinker around. This is not. I'm not going to like talk about these numbers a lot because I don't trust them fully yet. But I've been tinkering around with my own like personal power rankings based on uh, some number fire metrics, and right now they have Green Bay second behind Kansas City. That to me <laughs> feels high. Uh, right. But I, it's hard for me to, like, put a team above them. New Orleans, I think that you can make that case for sure. But Green Bay has a better path uh, with with their leg up in the seating for the try to get that by now. Although I would favor, like, if you gave me New Orleans, Green Bay on neutral site, I might go New Orleans there. I kind of think that the, the optimism in Green Bay is justified. Now, we're not talking about Green Bay's game on the show today. In the past... You haven't been very high in Green Bay, but that was last year. 2020 well, is different. Aaron Rodgers is playing better now. So right. what are your numbers saying about them with how they played so far this year? Well, I, I think my view is that in terms of upside of the offense, I think all three of those teams, New Orleans, Green Bay, and and Tampa Bay, all have upside. Like it, yeah. when those offenses are are at their best, I think we're, we're going to put them in the same class, right? Yeah. We can't really put Green Bay's defense in the same class as the other two teams. True. So that that's where I would kind of balk at that a little bit. Yes, they're in, they're in a good position. Um, yes, they do have probably the best cornerback in the league in Jair Alexander. But you know they look pretty average when when we're talking about pass defense uh, this year. They they haven't uh, you know they were even a little bit better last year. They don't really try very hard to defend the run, which which is not necessarily the worst strategy. It's it's uh, something, but but they just don't have the defense I think that New Orleans and uh, Tampa Bay do. Yeah, and I think that that uh, is a good counterpoint and like part of the flaw with like, all right, not a flaw, it's an intentional flaw. I downplay defensive metrics in these power rankings. Like they're obviously in there and pass defense is the second most heavily weighted thing within right. it, but like it's so heavily weighted towards passing offense that it's sure. going to downplay defense a little bit inherently. So um, interesting. we'll see, but I think the Packers are at least very interesting. The more interesting market may actually be the Super Bowl market because right now the Chiefs are plus 195. So inherently, if you're okay not liking the Chiefs, you can probably find value elsewhere. The problem is, can you actually do that? Can you actually right. be low on this Chiefs team? Are you just staying away from the Super Bowl market right now? Uh, or do you think the Chiefs have value? How are you in this one based on the current odds? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I think I'm staying away from this market. I think yeah. without actually doing a more precise calculation, Kansas City at plus 195 or whatever you said seems about right. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, they're the one offense that we could probably put ahead of New Orleans, Green Bay, and Tampa Bay at their best, maybe the only one. Uh, and Kansas City does have some issues on the defensive side of the ball, but um, 
you know, there is some reason uh, to think that their pass defense is better this year. Uh, their coverage grades have been better uh, with some of their secondary guys. So, you know, Kevin Cole told me this at the beginning of the year. He thinks that they could even actually be, be be better because of slight improvements in their defense. Yeah. Uh, again, they uh, they don't really try hard to to stop the run either. Right. <laughs> you know, the best player on the line, Chris Jones, is is a defensive tackle that's like a pass rush beast and not particularly good at, at stopping the run. So, um, yeah, it's the modern NFL, right? And um, right. So, like, what happens when you know a team like the Chiefs come up against the Ravens, right? Right. And and they're and the Ravens probably, if they don't have to, aren't even going to pretend to throw the ball. Right. Which. Normally isn't a good idea, but in a special circumstance, could be really interesting. That was one of the talking points last year for the AFC title game when they faced the Titans, because it was the same thing. Where like, I don't right. know if they actively encourage you to run against them, but they're pretty darn close because they, like sure. you said, they just don't care. Like, run the ball against us. Who cares? Right. And a lot of people use that as a justification to like the Titans in that game. But for some reason, they actually played pretty well defensively there. So I'm wondering right. if it's not a philosophical thing more than a personnel thing. Like, can they stop the run when they want to? I don't know if they can, because we've seen at times where they actually, it is actually a problem that they can't stop the run. So it may right. be more than a philosophical thing. Green Bay is the same thing. Like right. against San Francisco last year, like they, they should have been trying to stop the run and could not. So they just couldn't. Yep. yeah, you have to ask yourself, is it philosophical or is it personnel? With Kansas City last year, I think it was philosophical. With Green Bay, it was pretty clearly personnel. And that's that's a tough, tough way. Well, it's tough to decide which side things lie on. But Green Bay also likes to flood the field with defensive backs too, right? So right. I don't I don't right. think it's all personnel there. I think it's a combination of both. Right. And I don't think we want to take too much away from the small sample size of, of one game. You know, I think a lot of those things could could turn out differently. Um, but it's certainly something that you should be keeping an eye on when you're betting those big time playoff games. All right. So we have our eyes on the Bucks to win the NFC and staying away from the Super Bowl market because the Chiefs are just too dang good. Let's talk about some fun games here for week 15, starting off in the NFC North. Not the most appealing a game on paper because it's two six and seven teams, but both these teams have at least a shot at the playoffs. The Vikings are three and a half point favorites against the Bears. Total here is 47 and a half. And anecdotally, it feels like the Vikings defense has gotten a lot better recently. We know uh, Dr. Heger was early on this boat to say, hey, right. they're going to suck to open the year. And kudos to him for identifying that. You could have gotten good betting value betting against the Vikings early on as a result. But it feels like they've been better recently. Ed, do your numbers back up that that feel with the Vikings defense? I mean, not necessarily. Uh, you look at how they've done in terms of passing success rate on defense, and they've had, you know, better than NFL average is about 46 percent. And they've had they've done better than that against uh, Carolina, Jacksonville and Chicago. But think about those pass offenses. Right. Is that right. really saying too much? So you get some kind of weakish offenses and maybe they look a little bit better. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not buying that Minnesota's defense is, is that much better. Um, I'm, I'm going to stay away from that take. Are you interested in getting in on the Bears here then? Because it's possible that we could see a situation where the markets are buying into this Vikings defense and could allow you to buy into the Bears. The problem is we're getting a similar sentiment with the Bears offense. Suddenly people think sure. that Mitchell Trubisky has been revived oh when in actuality he had a half a garbage time against Green Bay and then has faced Houston and Detroit since. Right. So it's kind of hard to like say, OK, I want to fade the Vikings defense and bet Chicago when betting right. Chicago means betting Mitch Tr Mitchell Trubisky. So how does that all mesh together for you in trying to diagnose this game? Yeah, I mean, my numbers have been on Chicago for a couple of weeks now. We'll get to we'll see that that's the same case. And I'll give you some numbers a little bit later um, for and and part of the reason that it likes Chicago is that it likes their defense, um, you know, in terms of success rate, they've they've been adjusted for who you play they've been really good when i looked at it like the metrics were were worse when you looked at yards per play in both passing and, and rushing so it's 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 one of these situations where the defense is pretty good but they're probably allowing more uh big plays than than you you might expect i don't know if there's a necessarily a reason for that um but uh i think that's part of the the, the numbers like Chicago's defense by success rate and that that's kind of what's driving my numbers to see value in this team uh, you talk about Nick Foles versus uh, Mitchell Trubisky. So the way I handle that is I, as I look at what the markets think for the games in which they know 
either Foles or Trubisky has started. And um, so I use what I used to do is I used to if I wanted to evaluate Trubisky, evaluate Trubisky, I would just throw out the games with Foles. And then if I wanted to evaluate Foles, I would throw out the games with Trubisky. But I finally got smart and was like, no, I just I'm just going to split them up into different teams. Right. Oh, yeah. So so when you do that, then you can include all games and then you get a better look at all 32 teams, um, you know, split up amongst who who's playing the quarterback position. The market thinks they're the same. Yeah. Like within a half point, so there, there's no difference who's who's playing. Um, overall, my numbers like Minnesota by about two and a half points, so definitely suggest a little bit of value here uh, as on Chicago. So it's a point of value. Is that enough for you to actually bet Chicago, or do you think it's more just like, hey, if you have an inclination towards Chicago, you have like the leeway to bet it, or uh, how are you feeling about that? I mean, I haven't bet this yet, and I be honest, I haven't really been betting on Chicago much lately. But I'm I'm pretty intrigued. I haven't fully evaluated the injury list yet on this one, but yeah, I, I'm definitely intrigued by this because okay. I mean, we know Minnesota's not great. Like yeah. that, we're, we're I'm pretty sure about that on either yeah. side of the ball. Yeah. So, and while Chicago isn't great, um, I I think uh, I it, it it feels right in that sense. Uh, with this game, I would not be shocked to see an over. The total's already gone up a half or a point and a half, actually. It was 46, now 47 and a half. I think both these offenses are competent enough. And like you alluded to the big plays, like that's not predictive. Uh, right. But it also is in part due to the style in which they play. So I think an over here is in play. Um, so if I had to pick a, a number in this game, I would lean over 47 and a half. I want to stay away from the spread. But I think the this game could be kind of fun, at least, from a total perspective. Let's talk about another game that could be kind of fun for different reasons. That's the Patriots at the Dolphins. Dolphins, one-and-a-half-point favorites here. The total is 41-and-a-half. And I want to talk to you about what you were talking about before. You were talking about splitting up teams into being two separate teams for Chicago with Nick Foles and Mitchell Trubisky. Let's do the same here with Tua Tungavailoa and Ryan Fitzpatrick. How do the markets view Dolphins with Fitz versus Dolphins with Tua? Yeah, I, I think this is where it's really powerful to kind of take the market perspective because I, 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 whenever the Miami was playing, they were talking about benching Tua in one of the – I think it was this week. Yeah. Uh, and and well, it's it just the, like – The Bengals game. Well, I think was, was the one where they were like, okay, yeah, maybe we should bench him. Yeah. Game. But I'm like, guys, this, 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 this is a first-year starter, right? And – he, every first year starter is going to have his up and da- ups and downs. So that's why I like, kind of like to look at it in terms of what the markets think in these games. And um, they think that uh, to a Miami with Tua is two points better than Miami with Fitzpatrick. So I think that's, that's very telling. I think Miami is a really interesting team. They're, they're plus 10 in turnovers and that's driving part, one of the reasons that's driving their record right now. I think they got the very worst games from the Los Angeles Rams and the San Francisco 49ers. Um, neither of those teams played very well when they played Miami this year. Um, so, you know, I don't think they're as good as their 8-5 and five record suggests they are. In this matchup against New England, uh, Miami certainly is a little bit better in terms of success rate when I look as a team, both on offense and defense, compared to New England. So they definitely have that edge. But, you know... Um, yeah, so so but New England's pass defense has been getting better recently. That's something that my numbers have been looking at. Uh, they actually like New England by half point, so pretty much a coin flip in this game and suggest value on Bill Belichick. Interesting. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this game for my covering the future. It might be on the other side of this one okay. uh, because uh, I would do want to talk about that Patriots defense. Like you said, they've been better. Uh, they definitely have, but. I'm interested in the Dolphins offense here. So we'll talk about that in a cover in the future. We're also not going to talk about the Chiefs and Saints game here in the game by game breakdown for week number 15, because I had that as my cover in the future for yesterday. Ed has it as as his cover in the future for today. So no full breakdown of that here, but we'll give our full thoughts on that later on. So let's finish up this section with the Browns at the Giants. The Browns four and a half point favorites total is 44 and a half and I know the big story from Monday was Baltimore getting that win late and the betting angles around it, but Cleveland objectively played really well Monday night, uh, but they lost. But they've also faced a pretty soft schedule outside of Baltimore the past month and a half or so. So I want to check with you. How are your numbers feeling about the, the Browns broadly heading into this game? Yeah, I mean, they don't they don't particularly like the Browns. Uh, and I'll tell you a little. So um, at the beginning... 
Well, okay, so let's just get into it. I mean, this, my numbers like Cleveland by about 1.2 points in this game. So definitely suggesting value on Cleveland. So I talked about last week about how they were 6-0 and in, in one-score games, and we expect some regression to the mean. They're now 6-1 and in one-score games after after losing to Baltimore last week. And again, I mean, the defense is just terrible. They're, they're last in the NFL when I look at adjusted success rate. On offense, they're not particularly better. They're, they're 19th. But it's really bad on bad, right? I mean, the New York Giants are built in the wrong way. They they are built to be good at running the ball and stopping the run and not good at throwing the ball and defending the pass. So, uh, for example, on offense, they're 27th when I look at a adjusted success rate in passing, and they are 15th uh, when you look at running success rate. So they're just built the entirely the wrong way. Um, but I, I do see them actually potentially winning this game. Um, so at the beginning of the year, I have a texting thread with some of my buddies and I call Chicago, like the worst three and one team, uh, in the NFL or the history of the NFL. And I think that turned out to be okay. Pittsburgh being an 11 0, I was a little bit more public about saying that they were the worst 11 and 0 team. So, and then more recently I've been calling Cleveland the worst nine and three team, uh, in the NFL or the history of the NFL or however you want to do it, they've lost to Baltimore and, and why not? Let's, let's have them lose it to the New York giants. It's not, certainly not out of the question. Um, my numbers like Cleveland by a, a point, a little bit more than a point, but I could, I could certainly see Washington winning this game. That's right. The giants, right? Oh, uh, sorry. The yeah. giants. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's uh, an interesting game because like, I like Baker, so I always try not to like bet Browns games because I'm a, I'm a fan. I think that right. he's, uh, he's, he's really fun to watch. When he's on, he's like this electric guy. But they are prone to weird stuff. I don't know the way to quantify that. Mm -hmm. But the Browns are kind of a strange team where they can have some really funky games. Like they had some games against the Bengals this year. I mean, granted, when Joe Burrow was there, but like that defense is bad. And and we kind of saw that again on Monday night with the uh, with the Steelers or the Ravens putting up big points against them. So even Colt McCoy, if he wants mm -hmm. a starting for Daniel Jones here, could be able to move the ball, could be able to score some points, and that's a concern with Cleveland. I think that I have faith in this Browns offense, though. I think that that is that they are doing enough for me to feel good about them. And now uh, we just found out too that James Bradbury is not going to play this game for the Giants. That just mm -hmm. happened, you know, not too long ago. That could help them out as well. I I always want to be low on teams that have lost star players. No doubt Beckham being out for the Browns qualifies as that. But sure. it's tough with how good their offense has been since Odell got hurt. Even in that game against Baltimore, yeah. it's hard for me to like reconcile that in my brain. Because I want to you know be down on teams that lose star players. They lost a star player. But it seems like they're playing better. And I, I don't know if that's like due to familiarity, comfort with the with the new scheme under, under Kevin Stefanski or what. But like it's just weird the way things have worked with them. And that's made them a team that's been really hard for me to truly like comprehend for most of this year. Yeah, no. And uh, I think kind of what I'm looking at agrees with that. Right. The record is not consistent with the, with what the underlying metrics are saying. And the Giants aren't good, but. I, I thought Daniel Jones was good to play in this game, uh, or is is it a, is it the idea that he might get benched? Um, so he has an ankle injury now too. Um, okay. He originally had a, just a he had um, the original injury that was his hamstring. Then he hurt his ankle in addition to that on okay. or whatever the game on Sunday. So he now has multiple injuries. He was limited in practice on both uh, or on both Wednesday and Thursday. So there's still a chance that he plays, but it kind of now seems like he's not. And I think that to me, if I'm trying to, you know, make assumptions around this game, I'm probably operating under the assumption that he is not able to go just because it, it seems as if that's the way things are trending as of right now. But, you know, I think that it's a, uh, it's a it's a tough situation to read. It kind of seems like the market doesn't care. Uh, I know that Daniel Jones didn't play well on right. Sunday, but they've had this number posted the entire week. There's been no move in it based on Daniel Jones versus Colt McCoy. I, I don't know if he looked that bad. Like he didn't look good in the game against Arizona. He looked kind of like Daniel Jones taking sacks, you know, uh, making weird plays and stuff like that, like 2019 Josh Allen. Uh, but it's it's interesting for sure, but I think the Browns are at least interesting here. Uh, but we'll see how they play. 
All right, uh, we're going to circle back to that Chiefs Titans or that Chiefs Saints game in just one second here with covering the future because that's a fun game to break down. So let's do that for a close up shot for this week. Covering the future. So if you missed our college football edition of covering the spread for this week, my covering the future, of course, not college football, was NFL talking about this Chiefs Saints game. That's a really interesting game because. You know, we did, we're we probably not getting Drew Brees back, but now there is some word potentially he'll play. I don't think he'll play. Um, I'm still guessing that he will not. But this, this Chiefs line is minus three. I said yesterday I wanted Chiefs minus three because my thought process was I was guessing Taysom Hill would play. If that were confirmed, I would expect that line to move towards Kansas City, and I wanted to get ahead of that movement. Ed, you are also on Kansas City minus three. What yeah. is your rationale that got you to that number? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, it's one of these situations where I'm I'm looking at New Orleans with Taysom Hill at quarterback. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult there because you have to throw out that weird Denver game in which uh, New Orleans became a 17-point favorite because Denver was playing a, a practice team wide receiver at the quarterback position. So anyways, I throw that game out. And and when you when you do that and you look at what the market my market model says about this game, it says Kansas City by 4.3 points. So it certainly suggests value here. And I think everything else really agrees with that. Kansas City has the best offense, best quarterback in the NFL, uh, probably the best offensive-minded coach in, in Andy Reid. The numbers certainly suggest what they're doing this year. Uh, first, my adjusted passing success rate. Um, you know, and the Saints' defense has been great. They're fourth when I look at adjusted success rate. But I, I just think the, this Kansas City is a better unit when, when their offense is going to be uh, out on the field. I, I don't think anyone's going to necessarily disagree with that. When you look on the defensive side of the ball, again, like as we talked about earlier, like they, they don't really try to defend the run. They're average uh, when we talk about defending the pass. They're 15th in my adjusted success rate on passing plays. I did mention that some of their defenders have looked pretty good this year. When you look at the PFF grades, the primary example is uh, Rashad Felton, one of the cornerbacks. He was kind of had a part-time role last year, but he's a full-time player this year with a 73 coverage grade. Um, Brashad Breland has also gone from a grade of 51 last season to, to 68 this year. So if you believe in those grades, uh, I certainly do. I do a lot of um, when I'm when I'm looking at these games, I look a lot at coverage grades because that's the one thing that's really hard to get from numbers. So um, so they are potentially better than than last year. So that defense against the Taysom Hill offense, I, I, I think. Kansas City should be more than three point favorite. I'm I, I think this will get to three and a half by the time we kick off. And uh I I'm happy to grab it now at three. What Even is your read on Taysom Hill versus Drew Brees? Um, because we talked about this with, with it's Patrick and Tua. We talked about it uh before with Mitchell Trubisky and Nick Foles. What do the markets say is the gap between those two guys? Yeah, I mean it's it's a lot. Let's see. <laughs> So New Orleans with Drew Brees is six point six better points better than NFL average. Okay. And uh, New Orleans now is four points. So, so two point six points. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's a lot. It and a lot. I think that this number, at least to me, like I don't know, like if I'm just overly confident in the Chiefs, but like to me, this number says there is a let's say twenty percent chance that Drew Brees plays. That's kind of the way it feels. Because like if Drew Brees plays this, what's this number? Probably like one or so yeah. somewhere in there. So uh, maybe two, but still, I think that we're getting some Drew Brees in this number, and I still don't think he'll play, despite the right. report on Thursday that there is a possibility he will. I don't think he will personally. That's why I'm comfortable taking the Chiefs minus three. So betting on Patrick Mahomes is always a good feeling. I yeah, was exactly. on the other side of that last week. Um, and it was very scary. I did. I, I, I covered, I should not have, like, I don't, I didn't deserve to win that bet, but given the way my other stuff went last week, I'm not going to complain. So I <laughs> will feel good about betting on Patrick Mahomes this week, as opposed to betting against. Now, the reason I bet against the chiefs last week was because I wanted to ride the dolphins. So let's run it back one more time and bet on Miami here with my cover in the future. And I'm a bit worried about them for a couple of reasons. The first one is they're banged up. That's a risk. The second is that there is this narrative, there's that word, a brown Bill Belichick against rookie quarterbacks. And this is his first time facing Tua Tungavailoa. 
The third is the Patriots are on extra rest. They played last Thursday. The Dolphins had the Chiefs on Sunday. So there are a couple of factors here that do point us towards the Patriots. But I think they're dragging it down enough where the Dolphins are actually a value here. So I want the Dolphins minus one and a half. And a big part of that is I don't think Tua has been as bad as the perception has been. Uh, he's averaging 0.15 passing net expected points per drop back based on number fires metrics. Ryan Fitzpatrick was at 0.18. So it has been a downgrade. So the markets, you know, make, make sense. Like he has been a downgrade. League average 0.14. But that's not a huge gap. They were both close to league average. They were close to each other. But the sentiment seems to lean heavily toward Tua struggling. You look at the first half of that Bengals game. You talk about, you know, where people were saying he might get benched. That was pretty justified. He played bad there. In the second half, though, he played a lot better. We saw him play pretty well in the second half against the Chiefs, too. He was at .18 passing net expected points per drop back in the second half of that game. And that was without all of his pass catch. We saw Mike Gesicki leave, Devontae Parker left, Jakeem Grant left that game. They might not play, but without them, Tua played pretty well in the second half against the Chiefs. But there's also a chance those guys play because surprise, 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 Mike Gesicki was actually limited in practice on Thursday. Devontae Parker and Jakeem Grant were both limited on Wednesday. They might actually be able to play. And I think a, a part of this number is pessimism around this Dolphins offense with all the injuries that they've got. But I think that we're going to get at least one of Parker, uh, Grant, or Gasicki. And if we get that, that definitely helps. And there's a possibility, as remote as it may be, that we get all three with the Dolphins pushing for a playoff spot here. That was that performance by two in the second half last week was against a pass defense that, despite the Patriots' gains, is still better than the Patriots' uh, the Patriots' pass defense. So I think Tua should be fine here. I also just... Don't know how the Patriots will move the football. They rank 24th in schedule adjusted offense. The Dolphins are seventh defensively. So I think it, this is just one that should favor the Dolphins. And yes, there are factors that that do point us towards the Patriots. But even after considering those, I think minus one and a half is forgiving enough to ride with Miami here. Now, Ed, you and I haven't really gone head to head too often this year. So it makes me a little nervous to say the <laughs> least, but I understand your rationale behind it. So like I can respect it, but I, I think that to me, I just have a little bit of faith in Tua that I want to ride that and bet the Dolphins minus one and a half year. But again, I understand where you're coming from too. Well, I wanted to ask you, don't we throw out all the Bill Belichick narratives after this season? I mean, probably. I mean, there was probably <laughs> although, this idea. Although that, that, you know, I, I don't like this narrative. I think it's very stupid. But, like, the the Bill Belichick against rookie quarterbacks narrative regained life when Justin Herbert struggled, but that's also oh, the right. Chargers. Yeah. What Like, what's the coaching discrepancy between Brian Flores and Anthony Lynn? Like, it's enough. I think right. Brian Flores is smart enough. I trust Brian Flores well, to have— knows. Yeah, right. Chan Gailey's a, a seasoned veteran. He knows what he's doing, too. I trust them more than I trust the Chargers coaching staff. Sure, and and Brian Flores is going to know more about Belichick and what he wants to do as right. well, being under his staff before. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Belichick is a big mystery to, to me this year, right? Yeah. I mean, he, he brought most of that secondary back, at least all his coverage corners. Uh, Stephon Gilmore hasn't been as good this year, but for them to drop to, you know, from top two uh, in terms of pass defense last year to, you know, below NFL average, that it's almost something I didn't think was possible. Yeah. And, like we and, talk about regression, but regression what? does not mean you're going to bounce to like, right. you know, 18th. It's like, okay, you're not going to be historically great. You might wind up being seventh or something like that. And exactly. the Patriots have, they've regressed and then some effectively. Yeah. Here. Yeah, exactly. And I just find that strange. And, you know, on the other side of the ball, you, you have Cam Newton who's gotten to a Super Bowl before. I mean, maybe, maybe that was a little bit of a, of a miracle season. And, and I think it was for Cam. Um, but, you know, it's not like he's starting a rookie at the at the quarterback position either, right? So I guess I would just expect more on New England. Maybe they will uh, going down the stretch here, but I mean, they didn't look that good against the Rams last last week either. Right. But then the Rams are a pretty good football team. So yeah, I mean, it's interesting to reexamine these narratives, and I I kind of wonder what what people are th thinking about that. 
I think it's fun because you think back to when Tom Brady signed the Bucks. You could bet the Bucks. I think it was like plus one thirty six was the number we discussed in the show to have a better record than right. the Patriots. Yeah, it was right. plus money and it was juiced right. up quite a bit. I remember that well, and I think it moved very quickly towards Tampa Bay. Uh, but I think they can clinch it this week if they haven't already. So um, that was a fun one. Uh, it's been it's been a weird year for sure, but I think that one at least was beneficial. So we'll see if they can clinch the deal here on Sunday. That is all that we have for this week here on Covering the Spread. Ed, what is going on for you over at the Power Rank this week? Yeah, please check out the Power Rank YouTube channel. Drew Martin has been doing college football videos over there. He talked about Clemson, Notre Dame. He talked about Alabama, Florida. He talked about Louisiana, Coastal Carolina. So really good video. He's His record... Uh, with his handicapping and, and using my numbers has been pretty good this season. So the Power Rank YouTube channel, you can check that out at thepowerrank.us. And, uh, oh, yeah, I have Richard Johnson on Football Analytics Show. Sweet. Great conversation. Uh, we got into also all the championship games and his, and his takes on those. But I also got to ask him about uh, if he were all-powerful, what he would do to fix the situation with black, uh, the lack of black head coaches in college yeah. football. So. That was a really interesting conversation. I asked him to to start rattling off some uh, below coordinator people that he thought would be great coaches, and he just, oh, I mean, it was it was very rapid fire. It was a cool moment uh, where he's just like, yeah, there's a lot of guys out there. Just yeah. get creative, interview these guys. So Richard Johnson, we've had him on this podcast. Yep. He was terrific talking about college football earlier uh, this year, and. Um, He's also doing some things for 538. Uh, I haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but he wrote an article about college football betting yeah. that came out within the last couple of days. Uh, certainly something that I think this audience would be very interested in. Yes. Uh, so, he, yeah. he tweeted it out, and I saw it, and I was like, oh, he's just tweeting out this article. And then I clicked on it because it was an interesting topic, and I saw, oh, he wrote this, and it yeah. like – Caught me by surprise. So Richard is on the SEC Network. He's on 538. Yep. Dude's blowing up. So I'm happy for him. He, he does great work. So the uh, check Post. that out. Yep. What's that? He's at, he writes for the Washington Post, too. Yeah. So uh, check out the Football Analytics Show to, to get that interview with Richard. I'll be certain to check that out myself. And also check out the PowerRank.us to get the YouTube link for that. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. We recorded our daily fantasy podcast earlier this morning. Myself and Brandon Gadula breaking down the Week 15 main slate. You can find that by searching for the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. Do not forget to follow us, the FanDuel Podcast Network, at FanDuel Podcast as well. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck to you both with your college football championship game bets and also the NFL. We'll talk to you once again on Tuesday next week to get you set for NFL Week 16. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 